Hi guys. Tonight we're going to talk about forgetting. How is it that we've made all these memories and we just don't have access to them sometimes? Where do they go? What happens to them? Let's take a look. So this one we talked a little bit about in class. Uh, this is Jill Price. Um, she's one of those people included in that group that we looked at the other day who can remember every single second of their lives. She's a little different. Um, while she does have hyperthymesia, which is the official name for that condition, uh, she, and she not only recalls everything, but is unable to forget anything. See, that's her problem. She is not, um, she doesn't share the uh, positive opinion of her condition that the other individuals that we saw in that video have. She actually thinks it's horrible and says that she suffers from it because she can't forget anything. So uh, the, mo the important and the mundane are always accessible. Everything is always there for her. It forms like a running movie, she says, of images and information that run simultaneously with current stimuli. So it's hard for her to concentrate on things because there's constantly memories just coming to the forefront of her consciousness. Um, and she said that she'll be talking to someone and also seeing something else. So it's kind of like she's getting cross-feed. Um, another possible problem, if we were unable to forget, we might not focus well on current stimuli because of the presence of intrusive memories. I know that's cut off, but it says because of the presence of intrusive memories. So it's hard to focus because, for her at least, because all of these memories just kept flooding in and are distracting her from using her working memory in the moment. Um, so we found that the brain has basically a two-track mind. And uh, we found this through the study of this guy named Henry Mollison. So he has amnesia. And he couldn't figure out why he looked in the mirror and he couldn't understand why he didn't look 27. So they removed his hippocampus in 20, at the age of 27, which ended his seizures that he was having, but it also ended his ability to form new memories, new explicit memories. So he's unable to form new long-term memories. So he could learn new skills, procedures, locations, and objects of games, but had no memory of the lessons or the instructors. Why? Well, we talked about this two ways of processing, automatic processing and um, effortful processing. So everything that goes into HM's brain is done automatically. He's not able to effortfully process anything. And that's the essence of it, his type of amnesia. So he retained memories from before his surgery, but afterwards he could not make new memories. So we'll talk about this a little bit. There's two types of amnesia. So HM's condition is called retrograde amnesia, and that's your classical, um, you wake up and you have no memory of anything. You can't remember who you are or what you did or anything about your life. So you can't retrieve memories from the past. But then there's what's called enterograde amnesia, um, which is what the guy in the movie Memento has. And that refers to the inability to form new long-term memories. So while retrograde refers to the inability to retrieve them from the past, enterograde refers to the inability to form new memories. A little bit different. So retrograde amnesia can be caused by head injury or emotional trauma, but it's often temporary. It wears off after a while. And it be, can be also be caused by more severe brain, dam brain damage, but in that case, it may include enterograde amnesia. So you're, it's like that one poor guy, Clive, the British guy. He's unable to make memories of the past, or he's unable to retrieve memories of, from the past, but he's also unable to form new memories of the present. He's just kind of stuck in the present with his working memory. So H.M. and Jimmy, the guys that we talked about, um, Lived, lived with no memories of life after surgery. Um, and like we said, the movie Memento is an example of retrograde amnesia. Oh, I'm sorry, enterograde amnesia. So as your lifespan goes on, um, it can contribute to trauma, injury, and surgery. I'm sorry, the trauma, injury, and surgery um, could have a worsening effect as your lifespan goes on. So the older you get, the worse this condition will get. So we have this penny, penny memory test. Uh, so just real quick, what words and numbers in which locations are on the front of a US one cent coin? 
I mean, we did this in the book, or you should have, but can you remember what a penny looks like? You've seen it thousands of times in your life. It's probably pretty difficult to recall because we're processing it automatically, right? Because we didn't sit there and rehearse it and memorize what's on the penny. It just kind of got processed implicitly. So if you want to check this, uh, do this test for yourself, here's a link. Um, again, probably won't be able to click it, but I'll leave it up there for a couple seconds so that you can copy it down or pause the video and copy it down. But try this out for yourself and see how you do. So most forgetting is due to what's called encoding failure. Um, not an inability to retrieve, but the problem was in encoding in the first place. So um, if we look at this chart, we have our usual um, set up to how memory gets formed, but if we look at the, the last part, the encoding is what failed. Not the retrieval, but the encoding. So something went wrong when you encoded it. You didn't um, maybe use some of those tricks that we use to encode it properly, and it just got processed implicitly. So if we've got the penny image wrong, did we fail to retrieve the information? Um, as I was saying, it could be that we never paid attention to the penny details and didn't select them from sensory memory to hold in working memory. So it was never encoded properly in the first place. So even if we looked once at the penny and paid attention to it, we still didn't bother rehearsing it and encoding it into long-term memory, like I said. It's not an issue of retrieval, it's an issue of the initial encoding. So now we have what's called storage decay. And so this guy Ebbinghaus figured this out as well. And he found that material encoded into long-term memory will decay if the memory is never used, recalled, and restored. So that's why when someone reminds you of something that you haven't thought about in years and years and years, it's kind of difficult to recall the specifics of that memory. Um, so decay is like um, long-term potentiation in reverse, or like pruning, meaning the unused connection and networks wither while used memories, while well-used memory traces are maintained. So you ever hear that saying, if you don't use it, you lose it? It's like that. Um, it's like a muscle. If you don't use your muscle enough, it atrophies and decays and falls off. The same with memories. If you don't recall them and rehearse them often, then they kind of decay. Um, but it levels off at a point. Um, for example, memory for both non syllables and Spanish lessons decay rapidly, but it levels off at a certain point. So rather than encoding failure, we also have retrieval failure. So as you can see, we're unable to retrieve it. We've encoded it properly, but we can't get it out again. So sometimes the memory itself does not decay. Instead, what decays are the associations and links that help us find our way to the stored memory. And as a result, some, stores me some stored memories seem just below the surface. This is this tip of the tongue phenomenon where you're like, ah, oh, I know that guy's name. What's his name? Ah, oh, it's right there. It's literally right there. It starts with a P. Ah, oh, I can't right on the tip of my tongue. That's that phenomenon. And so to prevent this retrieval failure when storing and rehearsing memories, you can build multiple associations, forming a web of associations, where you can link images, rhymes, categories, lists, cues. The more robust your web of associations is, the better chance you have at retrieving it, because you can come at it from multiple angles. So there's also what's called interference and positive transfer. Another downside of not forgetting is that old and new memories can interfere with one another, making it difficult to store new memories and retrieve old ones. We get cross-feed. We can't tell which is an old memory, which is a new memory. So uh, occasionally, the opposite happens, too. In positive transfer, old information makes it easier to learn new related information. You build upon what you already knew. That's how school works. You learn the basis, the foundation, the beginning, and then that information makes it easier to learn the subsequent things. And proactive interference occurs when past, interference, past information interferes in a forward acting way with learning new information. So for example, you may have strong memories of a previous principle, and this memory makes it difficult to learn the new principle's name. So the old memory of the principle is keeping you from forming new memories of the new principle. So we also have what's called retroactive interference in sleep. Retroactive interference occurs when new stimuli and learning interferes with storage and retrieval of previously formed memories. So we can see 
that anything that we um, learn can impede us from accessing memories of the past. In one study, students who studied right before eight hours of sleep had better recall than those who studied eight hours of daily before eight hours of daily activity. So that shows that we do this processing um, when we sleep. So if you studied right before your sleep, then that information is fresh in your brain and gets processed in a better way so that you can retrieve it easier. Um, and again, the daily activity retroactively interfered with the morning's learning. So because um, the act, you were involved in this activity and you weren't paying attention, your brain didn't have you know, those eight hours just to process it. It was doing other things. Um, it interfered with uh, the memory being formed. And now, finally, there's this concept of motivated forgetting, which is kind of controversial. So we know that memory is fallible and changeable, but we can practice motivated forgetting. That is, choo but can we practice this is the question, I should say. Choosing to forget or to change our memories? Now, that's a question. Uh, Freud believed that we can sometimes make an unconscious decision to bury our anxiety-provoking memories and hide them for conscious awareness. He called this repression. Now, there's a difference. We don't choose to do this. We do this unconsciously. Um, but there's new techniques of psychotherapy and medication intervention that may allow us to erase or prevent the reconsolidation of recalled memories. Um, and there's this movie, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. You may have seen it. We'll watch it a little bit next week. Um, and that's the point of the movie, is the guy wants to erase his memories. So motiv motivated forgetting is not common. Uh, we don't even know if it can actually occur. Uh, more often, it's the case that recall is full of errors. Um, like we said, that retrieval fa failure. And again, people try not to think about painful memories. If they fail to rehearse those memories, the memories can fade. And I think this is what Freud means by repression. All right, so that does it for forgetting. Hopefully you won't forget this. I uh, hope you all have a wonderful weekend. Take care.